In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The parable of the mustard seed with its imagery of the kingdom of heaven growing into a great tree, one that provides a home and shelter for the smallest in creation, is an attractive and compelling topic. But we have spoken about seeds quite a lot recently, and so it seemed a good idea to change gear by looking at the reading from Romans, whilst at the same time keeping the Gospel reading in mind. As St. Paul tells us, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. His words are arranged in a particular sequence and seem to offer a kind of formula for what he defines as salvation. And yet theologians throughout the age have argued about this section of his epistle to the Romans probably more than any other of his phrases. And the debate, still hotly continued by Stum, centers around this idea of predestination. That in some way God already has in his mind what is yet to happen. We can recognize this sentiment being expressed when people say such things as, it was God's will, everything happens for a reason, there must be a purpose but I don't know what it is. For a start, it would be a strange world indeed where we blithely accepted that everything that took place in it was already intended by God. That would be to utterly discount our human free will to do good or evil as merely an illusion, the jerky movements of a wooden doll as the puppet master twitches upon the string. It would be to discount our ability to choose what is right, to express some inner goodness, because we are instead merely doing what we have been programmed to do. And conversely, to explain away the worst excesses of human nature as also divinely orchestrated. All moral significance would effectively be removed from any decisions we might take. And it's not good enough to say that we do have free will, just that God knows everything we are going to do in advance. Because that just brings us back full circle to wonder whether we really have any choice at all. And also some very odd questions about time itself. Certain theories of predestination, most notably from John Calvin and Theodore Beza hold that God has, in advance of our lives, indeed in advance of time itself, already pre-selected those who are to hear and accept the gospel and therefore be saved, and those who are either not to hear it at all, or those who will hear and reject it, and consequently be damned. That God has in advance decided who should live forever, and who should suffer forever, and there is nothing we can do about it. In fairness to those who held, and indeed still hold, this view, they were and are struggling with the very issue confronted in last week's Gospel parable of the wheat and the weeds, and this week's parable of the net thrown into the sea, at least if taken literally. And people have come up with various attempts to explain why a just God might appear to be perpetrating an injustice. Some, of course, were relatively sanguine about divine punishment for their fellow human beings. They accepted the potential injustice of faraway peoples being condemned without ever having heard the gospel as part of God's plan that should be accepted without question. 
and also proof of the superiority of certain races and cultures. But then there were those who continued to be troubled by the possibility of people from other lands and cultures across the world being condemned for all time, even though they had never even had the opportunity to encounter the gospel, let alone choose to accept or reject it. Such people often engaged personally or supported the dedicated missionary work of previous centuries, seeking to give other peoples and faiths and cultures at least a chance to hear about Jesus and be spared the coming fire. But much of this missional work had the same basic assumption. Accept Jesus and live, reject or just never have the chance to choose him and suffer horribly forever. This shows how you can tie yourself up in knots when you try to make each and every word and sentence of the Bible inerrant, to be taken literally without either interpreting or setting in context. You end up with reductio ad absurdum, reduction to the absurd. And I believe to continue to insist on this kind of approach to the Bible as the only legitimate way of being Christian in our present age will simply bring the Christian faith into disrepute and further scepticism, as thinking, feeling, and questioning people can no longer accept such authoritarian and absolutist views from the past. And also to insist on a notion of justice in which those deemed guilty or somehow lacking must always be punished severely and without ceasing seems to belong to a previous age where cruelty was routinely condoned and sanctioned by society. But is that really justice? Part of me despairs that I even need to ask that question. Taken as a whole rather than in isolated nuggets, the record of the whole gospel surely inclines towards a different kind of justice, a new way of faith, and a new and more inclusive way of loving. The reason for Christ's sacrifice on the cross was not to create a new clique of the chosen to the abandonment of all others. It wasn't to offer a blood sacrifice to an ancient God of anger and vengeance in order to spare us eternal torment. It certainly wasn't to exclude the very people Jesus had come to teach and emancipate from older, more dogmatic, harsher expressions of faith, but to witness to a new openness and a new way of relating to the divine and the holy. We should truly mean it when we say that Jesus opened wide his arms on the cross. His ministry had revealed a desire not only to address the people of Israel, but also to extend that message to those beyond conventional boundaries. The whole thrust of the Gospels is away from notions of a privileged few and towards the offering of God's covenant to all mankind. Jew and Gentile, worthy and unworthy alike. Paul's entire mission was to proclaim that same gospel across the known world of his time. I remember hearing this phrase from a tutor of mine at Oxford, herself quoting from the theologian Paul Tillich, and I have never forgotten it. God totally accepts us. Our task in life is to learn to accept that acceptance. Christ is calling all of us, all of mankind, to follow his lead, but not by being members of an exclusive club 
or to be part of some protection racket of the cosmos. His love is extended to all of us, whoever and wherever we are. And to accept that love is to show that love, however it might be labelled or named. I also remember how Sister Alma of the Society of St Margaret at Walsingham once told me a story. She was born and raised in the Caribbean, one child of a very large family. One morning, all the children, Alma, sisters and brothers, were seated at the breakfast table and one of them was upset about going to school. Someone there was calling him names. Sister Alma's mother, a figure of comfort and authority, sitting at the top of the table, called down. Don't you fret now, don't you cry, and don't you worry about names, child, because God don't make no rubbish. That is the kind of God I believe in and I commend to you. That is a God for the whole of one's life, the good times and the bad, the hopes, the fears, uncertainties and the doubts. The God who loves all that is made with the careful and nurturing hand of a parent, forgiving, patient, ever accepting. Because God don't make no rubbish. Amen.